31. At a great distance. Autumn. O giver of my lovely green in spring, a dancing, singing green upon my tree. My green has passed, I have no song to sing. What will my autumn be? Must it be, though alive, as all but dead, a heavy-footed and a silent thing? Effectless, sapless, tedious, limited, a withered vanishing? Thus I, but he to me, have I not shown in glowing woodland's golden parable the splendour of my purpose for mine own, I, their Emmanuel? Now shalt thou see, my child, what I will do, for as thy lingering autumn days unfold, the lovely singing green of hitherto will come to thee in gold. There has no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, so this, which I will copy from a friend's letter, will speak perhaps to many. It spoke to me because, as I wrote before, I had not thought of any autumn. I had prayed and confidently expected a quick flight on a midsummer day, but a tree in autumn foliage is not a painted fraud, nor is the word of the living God of none effect. The devil was tempting me the other day in a time of much physical weakness and some loneliness of spirit by suggesting that God did not seem to be keeping his promise about something long prayed for. I picked up a large type RV New Testament, which I generally read in bed, opened it at random, and these words stood out on the page. But it is not as though the word of God hath come to naught. And in a flash I saw afresh that the Lord has wider purposes and something bigger for us than we think, that we must not miss the greater by fixing our whole attention on the less. He that believeth on him shall not be put to shame. But the soul of the ill is a curious thing. It may settle on some rock of assurance and then be swept off its feet by a new wave just when it had begun to look forward to the blessing of quietness, just when it was learning to say contentedly, All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Even its nearest hardly understand if it foolishly tells of this private wave. But lately a friend expressed it unconsciously and perfectly, as she spoke of an invalid so tenderly sheltered that she is likely to live for years. It sounded as though she meant that the angel of death could hardly find his way into a room whose doors and windows were so carefully shut against him. Yes, that is it. That is the heart's unspoken fear, and with the word the enemy comes in like a flood. Is this room so protected that he will not be able to find the way in for a long, long time? Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Like the white wings of flying birds against a dark cloud, so are such words as they glance across the troubled mind. But how can the outward perish if loving hands take such care of it? To live in vigor, we are ready for that, however many be the years appointed. To be folded up in the soft wrappings of luxurious ease, that is different. But anything that brings to memory the vision of St. John, his servants shall, shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Or St. Paul's, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, can call those floods of longing. The tale of one whose warfare is accomplished, perhaps after a very short fight, the enchantment of music, the cadence of a hymn, can call them. The kindling words, O oh, think, to clasp a hand outstretched, and that God's hand, to breathe new air, and that celestial air, to feel refreshed, and know it immortality. O oh, think, to pass from storm and stress, to one unbroken calm, to wake and find it glory, can carry us up to the top of the house, and show us what the pilgrim saw. And behold, at a great distance, he saw a most pleasant mountainous country, beautified with woods, vineyards, fruits of all sorts, flowers also, with springs and fountains, very delectable to behold. Then he asked the name of the country. They said it was Emmanuel's land, 
and then we have to go downstairs again. The land is at a great distance, farther away than even that which the pilgrims saw later from the hill, called Clear, when, looking through the glass, they thought they saw something like the gate, and also some of the glory of the place, and the enemy comes in like a flood. Is there no standard to lift up against him? Must we be perpetually enfeebled by homesickness of the heart? When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. There we have it. As the sight of a triumphant flag to a smitten foe, so is the word of the Lord our Deliverer to him who would shatter our peace. We need not be overwhelmed. How foolish this letter will appear to the well and the able, who have only to will and do. But I hope that they will not read it. It is not for them. It is only for those whom pain has sorely tried and who are discovering how intricate is the intertwining of spirit, soul, and body. Arguments, expostulations, sensible reflections, good advice have no effect upon that entangled fact. But this does not excuse weakness. Nothing does. And the wise old Rutherford has often shamed me. I wonder many times that a child of God should ever have a sad heart. Considering what their Lord is preparing, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Home unto myself, O word of infinite peace. Today, my golden picture of horse chestnuts in autumn was set in front of me, and I let it speak to me as it never fails to speak. To the young who come into my room, it is just a beautiful picture. Their autumn is far out of sight, but I offer its luminous word to all to whom it has a voice. What does the inward man is renewed day by day, mean if it does not mean that our God will give gold for green, spiritual vigor, the shining heart that can be content and more than content, delighted with whatever his will may prove to be till he comes again to receive us unto himself. Such victory of spirit over flesh is miracle, but we learn to expect miracles from the God who can turn the grain of spring to gold.